Okay. So we're good to go. I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So well, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for coming to Sunday School. From Genesis to Revelation. From the beginning of time to the end of time. From Eden to eternity. God is relentlessly pursuing people for a relationship. That's what we talked about last week. And I want us to think about that just as, as a way, as a review, as we kind of zoom in on something today. But God is relentlessly pursuing people for one critical thing, and that is relationship. And in order for that to happen, he comes multiple times. We saw in this circle chart how he comes from heaven to earth, not once, not just once in the Garden of Eden where you have this unhindered, undefiled, undeviated relationship with Adam and Eve in the Garden, but he comes in Genesis. He comes in Exodus in the form, first of all in Genesis, we're going to look at today, he comes in the form of a fire and flaming torch. He comes with the glory cloud over the tabernacle. He comes with the glory cloud of his presence over the temple. And he comes in the incarnation. He comes through the Holy Spirit. He will come again in the clouds and all will see him. And his whole purpose in coming is to initiate relationship with humankind. And it's quite daunting when you see all of this unfold because it gives us a sense of that God is all about relationship. Now, can anybody relate to that theme of relationship? Mm -hmm. we, we can all relate to that. It's t first of all, it's for us. It ministers to us. But then we can also tell people that there's this thread in the Bible that holds it all together, that keeps it all together, and that's relationship. And that was my goal was last week for us to see how this thread uh, is woven throughout the scriptures. And that if you're talking about like this in, in technical terms, this is biblical theology. And so what is biblical theology? Well, it's theology that is woven through the biblical narrative really from Genesis to Revelation. So we're talking about the reality of God coming from heaven to earth, reality of the divine presence and what that means. And so the reality of the divine presence is one theme in larger themes that can be found in the biblical narrative. So you could trace another thing. You could trace the theme of kingdom. You could trace the theme of, well, temple, and I kind of sort of do that in this idea of presence. So there are a host of themes besides the divine presence that one could look at that does tie things together. Uh, I kind of feel like, the divine presence, the reality of the divine presence through this, this visual here is one of the key ones that kind of ties all these other themes together. And so that's when you read the scriptures, you, you begin to see repetition, don't you? We all, we all have been in the scriptures, and so we see repetition. And it's the divine author's way of showing us important points about himself. It's the divine author's way of showing um, cohesion in the history of redemption. Does that make sense? And so, that, so when you read the text, you want to be looking for themes <clears throat> as well. And so this is the, the one theme um, that I have spent a lot of time on and I love. And um, it is very near and dear to me because why? It's not just a lesson. It's not just a trajectory on paper. But it is a game changer in my everyday life. And I think as we continue to unpack the scriptures, and particularly this theme, I think we're going to see it's a, it's a game changer. This matters in what I do today. If I have a big picture perspective <coughs> that God is relentlessly pursuing me for relationship. And uh, so it's not just an academic exercise, far from it. But it affects me right here, and it affects me right now that he comes from heaven to earth, and he does it repeated times. So let's think about this just for a moment by way of review before I then zoom in on one key moment that's going to help us. Because the whole point of this is this, is we understand from Genesis chapter 1 that there is this beautiful relationship that Adam and Eve have with God. We said this last week, and I want to repeat it again, that Adam and Eve are, are walking and talking freely with God. He's, he... The divine presence is the centerpiece of the garden. And there's this unhindered, unmediated, undefiled relationship. And it's really, when we talk about the divine presence, it doesn't get any more beautiful than that. You know, Adam and Eve are talking and walking with God. And so have that image in your mind. It's the picture of intimacy. And that is 
what we're talking about relationship. And then in this intimate relationship, it reveals character. It reveals who he is, right? And so you have this easy intimacy. That's what, I, that's what we want to think about when we think about the garden. There are a lot of other things we can think about, but that's the picture-perfect relationship, isn't it? It's the picture-perfect um, image of intimacy. So that's what I mean when we talk about the divine presence. <clears throat> And so what happens is his character is made known to them because why? He is with them, correct? Like when you have a roommate, you know their character. You know their character very well. You might know of them before they move in with you, but when they move in with you, whether it's a spouse or a roommate, whatever, you get to know what they're like. <clears throat> and that's the idea is when Adam and Eve or with Yahweh in the, in the garden, there is that understanding of character. And so, so the, the idea is that character is revealed. And one's character becomes intelligible uh, whenever you are in relationship. And so what God does is, in all of these crescendos from Genesis to Revelation, he's revealing character. He's revealing aspects of himself. And so our goal, then, is to try to apprehend what is it. So, yeah, he wants relationship with us. Yeah, he wants relationship with us. Uh, but what is it that he's revealing in that relationship about himself to us? That's what we're getting at as well in each of these crescendos. And so when we think, then, um, about God coming from heaven to earth uh, to relate with humankind, uh, we did start in the garden. And I want to remind ourselves of what we have in the garden. I mentioned it last week, but for those that are just coming today, we literally have, besides this idea of intimacy in this unhindered, unmediated, undefiled relationship, I like to say that there was a people with whom the Lord was relating. There was a place for the relationship to unfold, and that was in the Garden of Eden, a locale a very specific locale, and then there was his presence. And in all of these ways, people, place, and presence, that's my sort of thing, my, my little way I like to think about this whole dynamic. People, place, and presence were in the garden. And, and then, well, we know what happens, is all of this was lost because of sin. So you have that key moment, Genesis 3, where all is lost. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. No longer do they have the immediacy of the garden for that place for the relationship to unfold. And then, of course, the presence, God's presence, right? Because they are distant from the divine presence as a result of, as a result of what? Of their defilement, as a result of disobedience, as a result of sin. So you have a tragic picture that unfolds after people placing prayer. No, we don't, it's, it's, the Genesis doesn't tell us other than God created humankind. But, but there is just this moment in space and time where he broke through and he created, and he created a people, place, and a presence. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's kind of way, by way of review. But then we come, um, as we move forward in all of this, I want to come to one key moment in this half, if you will, of the circle that guarantees this reality, that what was here in Eden that got lost because of humankind's sin uh, is now going to become guaranteed because of what happens in Genesis, Genesis 12 and 15, something absolutely critical. We don't understand that in terms of revelation of God's character and his presence and what that means. Then, then this part, well, we can understand it, but it's not as profound, if you will. So what happens in, in Genesis 12, 15 then? is all about a people, place, and a presence, and the guarantee that no matter what obstacles come in the way in all the redemptive history, that God is going to be faithful to a people, a place, and a presence. All right, so just think about this for a minute. This is a big trajectory. Where are we in this trajectory? We are waiting aren't we? We're waiting for one slice of this pie to be fulfilled because we're, we're in Acts 2, as it were. Like we're, we're the extension of the early church where we are being filled up with the Holy Spirit, and 
He has come by virtue of the Holy Spirit, filled us up, and has we've entered into a relationship with him. So this is, kind of, this is where we are, are we not? All of redemptive history has unfolded to this point. This is quite radical when you look at this. And the reason why I'm highlighting this at the beginning of the discussion of, of um, Genesis is because, friends, brothers and sisters, if all of this has taken place, if God has secured a people, place, and a presence through a many, many obstacles, namely, mainly our idolatry and our disobedience, if all of that has come to place, come to pass, and all we have is left is this, what does that give you? What, what kind of a demeanor does that give you about his presence yet to come? It's going to happen. Hello? It, like, this is where we really are if... If Genesis promises these things, if we've seen the tabernacle in the wilderness, if we've seen the temple in Jerusalem, we've seen the incarnation, well, we didn't see him, we, we would have, like John and the disciples, they beheld his glory. Uh, but if we are then also disciples and apostles because the Holy Spirit fills us up, we have just this left. So this gives us a real sense, doesn't it, of the second coming and the fulfillment of the consummation of God's ultimate desire, which is relationship. So I look at this and I go, whoa. I, it it, get, it kind of makes the hairs of my arm stand up when I think about the second coming, because we don't tend to think about that a lot, do we? We don't tend to think about, oh God, Jesus is coming back. We might do that a um, little bit here at Easter, a little bit at Christmas, um, but, but this is what is left on our chart. And how do we get there? Well, we get there by what we by what God revealed to Abraham in Genesis 12, and particularly, especially, especially uh, chapter 15. So is that, any, any questions before we kind of zoom in to this one moment that is going to indolibly make secure people, place, and presence? Okay, let's just get into it for a few minutes. And turn, if you have your Bibles, I want to begin by just zooming in a little bit on Genesis 12 first. Because in Genesis 12, one through three, all right? Genesis 12, one through three is a familiar text. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Thank you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. And I've given you handouts for this. Um, and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who curses you, I will curse. And by you, all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. Oh, very familiar verses, the Abrahamic promises, as, as it's often said. And so what do we have in these verses? Well, we have the command, first of all, for, um, by God for Abraham to go. And then several promises. And I guess if you were to summarize it in one word, because there's a word that's repeated a lot, it's blessing. Right? It's a, it's a blessing. He wants to bless Abraham. So that's a repeated word. And any time the biblical writers repeat words, it's there for our attention. So we better look at it a little bit deeper. So he wants to bless Abraham. But what he is doing is this. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, a lot of people don't realize that. He is asking him to give up and abandon a land. He's asking him to leave his land and family and clan. So he's asked to discard those things that bind him to his past in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. He's asked to leave. Now, I want you to think about this. What was considered in his time, in his day, the ultimate of security, an attachment to the land and the family clan. I mean, for, for some of us, that still is important, but especially in the culture then, right? He's asked to then give up a land and give up a clan and a family, the land of his birth, Ultimate security. Okay, Abe, are you going to do this? But let that sink in for a minute. He's being asked to give up a people and a place. And his gods, yet, yeah, you know, he's going to end up giving up the gods from where he came, um, from Ur of the Chaldees, as God continues to break through to reveal himself to Abraham. But do you see what I'm saying in these promises? Right now, at the beginning, he's saying to Abe, give these up. Give these up because guess what? I'm going to give you something. So it's a sacrificial thing that he's asking of Abe. I call him Abe. 
Uh, but then what is he promising? Well, a people, place, and a presence. And I want to just unpack that just for a few minutes because Yahweh is now going to imp- promise incredible blessings summed up in one word, blessing. And what does he say? You are going to be the father of many, right? So you're giving up a family, but you're going to be the father of many. Whoa, all right? Um, You've lost your own father, because we learn actually in chapter 11, right before these promises in Genesis 12, that his own father, Terah, died. And now Abram has lost his own father, Terah died in Haran, and he's saying, I'm going to make you a famed father forever. Wow. So, you're going to give up your people, you're going to give up your land, but I promise you a great people with a place for, the, for, your, for these people to relate one to another. So do you hear it? So he, I'm asking you to give up a people and a place, but what am I going to give you? A people and a place as well. And so you know the story then um, that... God takes good old Abe out for a, a lesson. And, and he just is kind of like I am. I love Abraham. Can you relate to him? I do, because I doubt like he does, and I don't know if you do, but whenever you have the Lord telling you to give up something, and then I'm going to give you something else, sounds even greater, do you tend to believe it? You need something to underline that. And so he takes him out to creation, and you know the story, and he says, look at the stars, and can you count them? And, of course, the answer is... Absolutely not. And so it's a, it's a supernatural thing at this moment that God is promising Abram. And he's got to do it. He's got to believe it at that moment. When, you look, when he has that, I love the object lesson. Object lessons are great. Right? So look at the stars. So of course, the answer is no, you can't count them. Um, but yet at this moment, he's meant to believe. In fact, the most amazing thing that happens is after God asks Abraham to leave those elements that are security for him, an identity, a people, a place, and all that. What does Abram do? Verse 4, you know what he does? He gets up and he goes. Gets up and he goes. <clears throat> wow. All right, that's what the New Testament writers are thinking of, too, when they're looking at Abraham um, and his response to God. Uh, so this is very, very important. So now what we have, then, is the Abrahamic promises, as it were, of a people, place, and presence. And do you see how what he lost is being promised by God? But do you see how it's representative of a bigger loss from Eden? What was lost at Eden, what Abraham was losing, God is doing what? I want to give to you a people at a place. And then the presence piece I'm going to talk about as well, because he also says... In verse 3 of chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed by you. So in that statement to Abraham, the presence of God is being not explicitly stated, but implicitly uh, by virtue of the blessing and the curse. Uh, You have to be near someone and for someone and with someone in order for them to curse someone who's hurting you. It implies immediacy. It implies presence, correct? as does um, the opposite. So we have then in these promises um, incredible things, a people, place, and a presence, and Abram responds and he gets up and he goes. Oh, if I would have the obedience to respond to Abram. And by the way, I want to tell you that this is, this is real life. These, these, are sto- this, this, these stories encourage us because we can insert ourselves right in the narrative and think, what would I do? Like, what would I have done? Yeah. If out of the blue, the Lord spoke to Abraham. And we're not told how he was spoken to. It might have been, a lot of times in the Old Testament, it was probably, it could have been through a vision. But the narrator in Genesis 12 doesn't tell us how that happened. Okay, fine. So now we have that in place, and now we get to, now we get to chapter 15. So turn to chapter 15, if you have your Bibles with you. And chapter 15 is really important in this discussion. Uh, So I want to highlight it by this way. When we get to Genesis 15, by the way, uh, this is just three chapters later from Genesis 12, a few chapters later, and what we have is a lot has happened between the promises that God made to Abraham and the reality on the ground with Abraham in Genesis 15. Uh, He's experienced famine. He's experienced 
separation from law. He's experienced war. The promise of many descendants uh, and a land would seem like, are you kidding me, God? In light of the things that have unfolded in chapter, well, literally five and following from chapter 12 and 13 and 14. Uh, and so Abraham is human and he is starting to wonder about these promises. And so it kind of like, well, God, are you really going to do what you say? Anybody ever been there? Yes, we have. And so he starts to question these incredible promises that were made to him in Genesis 12. Are you really going to do what you say? And I'm not so sure about it because, you know, my personal circumstances are drastically contradicting these promises. And basically, Genesis 15 is a, is a part of it is a response to Abram's questions. How, and we're going to look at it, and he's basically saying, are you really reliable to do what you said about a people, a place, and a presence? So he's putting them to the test, and we'll look at it in just a test in a human way, right? Like, we do that all the time. And so, but let me say something else. In, in, the, in, in what unfolds in chapter 15, he is not just questioning the promises of God. He's questioning his character. Because why? Your word is your character, isn't it? You know, Betsy, I'm going to have lunch with you, and if I don't follow through with it after like 10 months, you know, my word means nothing. My character is terrible, right? We get that. And I, and I do that too. I'm like, oh, let's get together. And then like a year later. Um, so I hope my character is not that bad. But anyway, you get, the, you get the idea, right? When you say something, it is obviously, when you promise something, when you say you're going to do something, and then it's just going to be an exposure of one's character, whether you do it or not. And so basically, Abraham is saying, are you reliable? Is your character such that you're going to do what you said? Now, that's important as we look at Genesis 15. So then we hear uh, what God says. So we, we, we are going to, this is, I'm going to start off with sort of the answer. God is going to tell Abraham in what happens in Genesis 15 that these promises about a people with whom he's going to relate to, the the place for the relationship to unfold in his presence are absolutely untouchable. They are not open to being tampered with. Not one ounce. And that's a remarkable statement. It's a mar- remarkable thing that unfolds, especially in light of the obstacles in the redemptive story to achieving a people, a place, and a presence. So he's going to say these promises are untouchable, and now let's look at why they will be untouchable. And so we come to Genesis 15, and that's where you have your little handout. <clears throat> and the, we have two questions that emerge that are going to allow then God to underline this people, place, and presence. So the first question and the first contradiction is really uh, Abraham's fear and first question, what will you give me? God's going to respond with an illustration from creation. Abraham's response is going to be his fear <coughs> into faith. And then he's going to have another question. How am I to know that I will possess land? God's response is going to be a covenant and associated ritual. So I'm going to unpack this in just a few minutes, um, well, in our, in our final 30 minutes of our class. And so we look at verse 2 of chapter 15, and he says, Well, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, and now we're told it's in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. Uh, I am your shield, your very great reward, in verse 2. But Abram said, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So what is he saying in that question? Basically, he's looking at the natural set of circumstances and saying, are you kidding me? You've promised me a a boatload of descendants. (laughs) Uh, And basically, you've given me no offspring is his complaint. Uh, Now, this is a problem because at least three times prior to Genesis 15, verse 2, we have been told that good old Abe has been promised a multitude of descendants. Uh, And so what was Abraham doing was when he says that uh, I remain childless and one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus, 
what he's saying in that statement and what he did in that reality was, was very common in the ancient world. And that was this, is you would, if you didn't have your own child born to you, you would take a slave born in the house and adopt him as the heir um, and so that there would be an inheritance. So Abram is doing what was common in the ancient Near East to do. He was just adopting his household slave for that purpose. And we have, by the way, just, there's lots of evidence in the ancient world where this kind of transaction took place, where you, the family didn't have children, and so in order to inherit, um, they, to pass on the inheritance, then they would adopt the household slave. So what I want us to highlight is this. Again, Abraham's natural circumstances grossly contradict the people side of the promise. And I guess I just want to say, isn't that how it always is? The promises of God that we read in the Bible to us corporately as the church and, and those things that God promises us from his word also are often contradicting our circumstances. Anybody, am I the only one? But I think we've all been in that boat. We're, we're looking, you know, right? Okay, seriously, you promised me, you know, and then I have this. I'll never forget one of the biggest prayer requests I had. And, the, well, and it wasn't so much a prayer. It was, it, I, re, uh, I want to call it a promise, a personal promise. I felt like I am going to call it a promise. Uh, and when I, when I prayed for this promise to get fulfilled, I could not believe how God fulfilled it. I was so disappointed. <laughs> Anybody have that kind of a thing? Like, really? You're going to fulfill it this way? Oh, wow. Okay, whoa. So, <laughs> oh. All right, anyway, we have our own stories. But the whole point is God is going to give Abraham staying power in what he promised him uh, in what unfolds. And so God's response in verse 4 is that his slave, this Eliezer, is not going to be the heir. He is not going to be the one that's going to uh, inherit. And then he illustrates in verse 5, and he takes him out to creation. And again, this is the second time he does this. Look towards the heaven. Can you count the stars, Abe? No, I can't. Uh, so shall your descendants be. Okay, fine. So this is a repeat. And then verse 6 is really amazing. Verse 6. So in verse 4 of chapter 12, after the command to go, Abram gets up and goes. And now in chapter 15, after this statement of the Lord, in verse 6, what do we read? Abraham believed the Lord, in verse 6, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Wow. This is the faith of Abraham, again. So it's twofold. It's Genesis 12, and it's also here in Genesis 15. And so what does it mean when it says that Abraham believed the Lord? It's real simple, actually. It's, 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 it's a word. You know, if I, if I were to put this meaning back on the text, it didn't mean this really. But um, it's basically meaning that Abraham was saying amen to what God had just promised. Like it's like what you do when you like what Tom says. Well, you don't guys, you guys don't say amen. We're not Pentecostal. We're conservative. What are we? I don't know. Some people say amen. Um, but it's, 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 it means we uh, have, we put credence in what was said, you know. Uh, so he trusted what was just said to him and what was just shown to him. We put credence in it. Kind of like, you know. Uh, okay, Abraham is saying amen to God, let it be so, that I have many descendants, right? We believe the cashier, you know, when they say this is $70 or whatever, or $2, we, we take credence and that, we trust their word, right? That makes sense. So that's what he's doing. He relied on the Lord and he trusted him in what was just said. And he's saying, let it be so. Let that sink in for a minute. Let it be so that I'm going to have these many descendants, as many as the stars that are in the sky, all right? Now, you know, I, I don't know, but this is another good example. I might be muttering under my breath, yeah, right, God, really, right? Surely. Mm -hmm. But Abram has a faith here. And this gives him, I want you to hear this, this gives him a standing with, a right standing with God. He doesn't have any actions here. It's just he takes credence in his words. And so as a result, we know what the New Testament writers say, that he is justified by his faith. And so as a result of his faith in this moment of show and tell, his account reflects that he is saved. 
So if you were to open up the life ledger of Abraham, you would see written in indelible ink is one word, righteous. Because why? He believed. And you know what? The same thing is for us when you open up the ledgers of our lives because we are sons and daughters of Abraham because of our faith. Our life ledger reads what? Righteous. It's profound and it's beautiful and it continues. And so, first question asked and answered. All right? And it's interesting because he started off in fear. Do not fear, Abraham. I am your shield, your, your very great reward. In verse 6, from fear to faith. You see that transition in just a few verses, from fear to faith. All right, now the second question Abraham has is about the land side of the promise. Verses 7 and 8. And here we read it. I, and he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Verse 8, but Abraham said, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I will possess it? So you see, he's, he's asking now about the land side of the promise. First was the descendants, the people side, and now the land. Again, another critical question. But here's why this question is especially critical. Because a couple times prior in the narrative, and you can look at it at Genesis 12, 1, Genesis 12, 7, 13, 15, and 17, the land has been promised both to Abraham and to his descendants. Well, so the question is, well, which is it? Who are you promising? It's not the same if I promise you one thing, right? And then I promise your family members. It's different. So Abraham is asking a legitimate, well, which is it? Giving it to one's children does not equate with giving it to Abraham. And so he's puzzled and he asks God yet again one more time. In other words, what I want us to think about in the statement is he cannot imagine beyond the, net, beyond the physical circumstances. But what God is telling him to do is believe in something bigger than the immediate. Believe in more of the eternal. Believe in something that's farther down the line. Do you hear that? Wow. And so he's asking him very, very specifically. And I think what he's showing Abraham is the eternal nature of what he's promising. He, so yeah, he's giving it to Abraham, yes, but he's giving it to more. He's giving it to his descendants. And since he can't see those descendants and he can't see that land, he has to have more faith. But he also has to realize that it's a supernatural thing that is being promised beyond what is tangible, beyond what he can see with his eyes. That's supernatural. All right. So he's puzzled and he questions God one more time. Is that, is that it etched in our minds, this, his, his <clears throat> questions? Because now comes the answer. There comes the answer. How do I know that I will possess the land? How do I know that, well, my descendants will possess the land? Both of those are involved in his questioning. And so we turn to Genesis, we stay in Genesis 15, and God's response to the people and place unfolds right here. But especially, especially verse 18, we read this. Let me just say by summary that the promises are going to be guaranteed. In fact, they're going to be signed, and I think I used this language last week, they're going to be signed, they're going to be sealed, and they're delivered. And, and God's going to say to Abraham, they are yours, particularly because of a ritual that he engages himself in, that is the Lord, in Genesis 15. Wow. Okay, so he's going to get his questions answered way beyond, way beyond anything he was imagining or thinking. So initially then, let's look at the very first. In verse 18, we read that God's response to the land question that was just asked in verse 7 comes in verse 18. On that day... The Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadnites. Don't you just want to say all that now Sunday morning? The Hittites, the Perizzites, you know, you get them. All right, fine. So he's promising this. On that day of questioning to the Lord, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. 
You could all, let me just tell you a little fun thing here. And you could also translate that phrase. I'm going to slide in a little bit of my Hebrew expertise here. But you could also translate that phrase on that day, the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. I don't like the way our, some of our translations do it. Um, and we're going to see why that is the case in a few minutes. And so basically what he's going to say is via this thing called covenant, which we haven't defined yet, via covenant, God is going to reassure Abraham that he is going to get the promised land and so will his descendants. Well, then what is a covenant? And I'm sure that you've probably talked about this in casket <coughs> at some point, right? Uh, if those of you attended the casket, uh, right? So just quickly, what is a covenant? Well, it's very simple. It's, well, it is very simple, actually. Um, it's much more than an agreement between two people. But it's, and I have this wonderful definition that I was given from my professor way back when, but it's an elected relationship of obligation under divine sanction. So in other words, basically, what I'm saying is this. It's an agreement between two people, such as in marriage. Tom and I elected each other for marriage, right? We elected. It's, 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 an, it's a relationship beyond blood ties. Um, obviously, I'm not related to Tom. He's not related to me. So it's an election beyond blood ties, thankfully. Um, and then uh, it's... We have obligations, marriage, you have obligations. What do you say, your vowels? And where do you say those vowels? You say them in a church, because why? We believe that God's presence is in the church. And so the third party to the covenant is the deity, is God. Me, Tom, and God. So it's like a triangle relationship. And I'm just using the marriage metaphor because I think it's the clearest and it's the easiest to wrap our minds around in terms of what it means. All right, fine. And so, simply put, this is what I want to say, is that a covenant does something. It creates a relationship that wasn't there before. It creates a relationship that was not there before. But that relationship has obligations. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to not marry another. I'm not going to, you know, till death do us part. In sickness and in health, those are the, the obligations, right, uh, that we say in the church under God's. And so in the ancient world, the same kind of thing entailed, and this is where it's really important to understand, because in order for relationships to be established in the political sphere or in the, person, or in the personal sphere, a covenant was the vehicle for that to unfold. So it's just a, it's just a vehicle. You could have, you could have, relationships that were established between equals. So they were called parity covenants. You know, David and Jonathan is a good example of a parity covenant. They were equals. Uh, but then you also had these kinds of relationships that were established between two parties that were not friends, but one was more of a superior and one was a, a, an, in, I don't want to, inferior. One was a subordinate and one was the superior. That, those are the nature of political arrangements. So the Mesopotamians would enter into a, a covenant relationship right, with the Egyptians, uh, or etc. So you could have political relationships that are devised, and then on the realm of personal. But not, no matter whether it's international politics that relationships were created, or you know, one to another, the whole point is the, that relationship had obligations, and they, they took it seriously. As long as I live, may God do this to me if I don't be faithful to you in the relationship, whether it's Jonathan and David or these broader international kind of relationships. And so basically then, God wants to create a special relationship with Abraham and his descendants through this vehicle of covenant. And so it's this special relationship that will guarantee the promises of a people, place, and presence back in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And the other thing that I would like to say is this: is what kind of let's think of what kind of arrangement is being made in this relationship? Is it equals? Is God and are, is God equal with Abram? I don't think so. So we already see now we have God. We're already defining the kind of relationship that's being established. It's a superior with a subordinate. Now there's one piece of information that I didn't share with you about covenants, and we could spend hours talking about covenants and covenant making in the ancient Near East. But there's this one part that I left out to tell you right now. That the parties that were involved in the relationship, they swore by oath 
to keep the obligations that were involved in that relationship. And that was spelled out in the covenant through a ritual, through a ritual that would seal the deal, that would underline. So we do that too. We have a ritual where we exchange rings. That's our, that's our sealing the deal is the exchange of rings. And other cultures do it in different ways too, but I, that's one that's familiar to me. And so we need to also note then the nature of the ritual relative to covenants between unequals. Typically, it would be the subordinate one in the relationship that would take the oath. The, the superior, it was assumed his duties and his responsibilities would be to protect the lesser in the relationship and to ward off any enemies and to be sure that they were being protected. That's the main essence of the superior. But it was typically the subordinate one in the relationship uh, who would take the oath. And the oath, again, is just swearing that I'm going to do right by you in this relationship. Okay? So it's the subordinate one in the relationship that took the oath. And this is how they typically did it. And this is why it is more accurate to say that covenants were cut instead of made because of this ritual that would seal the relationship. Typically, they would, the subordinate one would take animal pieces. He would cut them in two from snout to tail. And then those animal pieces would be laid against, against each other. And then what would happen is this, is the subordinate one would walk, pick, pick a passage. They would literally walk through those cut of animal pieces. And it's a, it's, it's a ritual, right? And everybody's is seeing it. Um, and the walking through of that cut up animal pieces would be saying, let me die like these animal pieces if I don't fulfill and if I'm not faithful in the relationship, if I don't fill the obligations that I'm signing on the dotted line for, let me die like these animals if I don't live up to what I promise. It's kind of like cursing yourself. So when you were kids, did you ever say this? Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. In other words, you're going to hurt yourself before, you're going to die before you tell Lisa, I will never tell my parents that we broke the law. There's a story behind that. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> so I cross my so that, so essentially, essentially, in this oath taking ceremony, the 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 subordinate one in the relationship would is 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 saying, I am with you through thick or thin, but my life depends on it. All right. So now, with all of this in place, let's go back to our story in fifteen. Because what unfolds in verses 9 through 11 is absolutely remarkable. 9 through 11, we read this. The Lord is asking Abraham to do something that sounds very similar to what I just described. So the Lord said to Abraham, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him. Oh, look what he does. He cut them in two and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, because they're too small, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. All right. Does that sound strangely familiar to us? God the superior is commanding Abram the subordinate to cut up a variety of animal pieces, and he does so. Now look what happens in 12 through 17. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with a great with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the 14th generation, your descendants will come back here for the sins of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And then we learn what? When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, then we're told, God made a covenant with Abraham. And so we learn from verse 12 
that a deep sleep and a great terrifying darkness came on Abraham. And I will tell you that this is the same kind of deep supernatural sleep that God put on Adam when he took the rib and made Eve. It's something supernatural that's taking place. It's suggesting a divine, awe-inspiring activity. And when he's in this, I like to call it a supernatural stupor, because it kind of is, right? The Lord speaks to him, verses 13 through 16. He speaks to him about the upcoming Egyptian bondage and the 400 years of slavery that we all know about from the book of Exodus. That's going to come upon his descendants first. So there's a big, big problem with the promises already being iterated here. God is saying, there's, before this is going to come to pass, you're going to have to deal with this. But then verse 17 is the heart of the matter. Verse 17, when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the animal pieces. So the Lord speaks to him, and now in verse 17, the Lord appears. Well, how do we know? It's the Lord. How do we know that he's appearing? Well, we read this smoking fire pot and flaming torch passed between the animal pieces. Well, in the Bible, smoke and fire are... are are always symbolic of the divine presence, right? Exodus 3, Exodus 19, the fire about Mount Sinai, etc. So now let's put all this together. You have the picture in your mind? Abraham, how am I know I'm going to get this? How am I going to know I'm going to get the land? Through covenant, all right? And then through this ritual now that seals the deal. So what we have is the Lord, who is now represented by the smoking fire pot, and the flaming torch passed between the cut up animal pieces. Here in Genesis, it's the superior, not the subordinate Abraham, who's making the dreadful passage. Where is Abraham? He's out. He's in a supernatural stupor. He has nothing to do with this covenant ritual. In fact, what the picture is this, is God alone is binding himself to his own promises. And in fact, it's a role reversal because he assumes the role of the subordinate and the superior at the same time. And so what is he doing? He's implicating himself to the obligations of both the subordinate one, and the superior in the relationship. Yahweh the superior, not Abraham the subordinate, by this action is swearing to bear the punishment for any future transgression in this relationship. Now, does that sound familiar to us? Does this idea of bearing punishment for transgression and sin and breaching the relationship. Sound familiar? Absolutely. Yahweh, the Lord, walking through the animal parts, foreshadows the cross. Because that's where Jesus, we all know this, took on himself the punishment for all the sons of Abraham and all the daughters of Abraham because he assumes the role of the sinner and takes our seat. And so our Genesis passage points us to the cross. Our Genesis, our Genesis passage drives the narrative of the Bible because it shows us that's the beginning of the great pursuit of God. God will eventually have to endure the curse of the covenant in order to keep the promises of the covenant. Why? Why? Because we can't live up to our side of the deal. We have nothing to bring to the table. And, and, and so we are under the curse of not keeping the obligations in the relationship, Galatians tells us. But we know that the New Testament says that Jesus became a curse for us, and so we're spared, we're spared the judgment. So in Genesis then, right here in Genesis, very early on in the storybook, right in Genesis, 
God takes this self-condemning oath, and he's, he's doing, that's why I brought up the childhood thing, cross my heart, hope to die, stick it in It's the same idea. He's taking this self-condemning oath through this ritual, and he's promising to Abraham. He's promising to his descendants that they would indeed be many and that they would indeed inherit the land. The nature of this ritual that we just described makes the promises untouchable because they're not dependent upon Abe. They're not dependent on anything human. The promises are not subject to change. And so God answers Abraham's question in a profound way. And what does he say? He says, what I have promised you, I'm staking my life on. It's signed, it's sealed, it's delivered, and it's yours, Abraham, because why? God's promises are absolutely true because they rest on him and his grace and his character. So he comes from heaven to earth in this form of this flaming torch and passes. So we don't see him other than in the fire, but he is coming to establish relationship once and for all with humankind. And that, if we don't, if we don't see how that is ironclad then then we won't, we won't get the rest of the story. Why, why does he continue to continue with people who are not faithful to their side of the bargain? Why does, he, why does he keep sticking with us? Because his character is such that he will not give up. He will not give up because he is, why? Relentlessly pursuing people for relationship. And so do you think that the character of God was made intelligible to Abram at this moment? Hello? You bet. So if it was made intelligible to him in the context of the ancient Near East where this ritual was common <coughs> practice, if it, how much more to us? The relentless pursuit of God is all about relationship. And so what is it that we can learn then by putting this all together and chew on this beautiful picture of the promises of God is that this is the first great crescendo in redemptive history where God is coming and it's all his initiative. He, it's divine initiative. It's a movement from heaven to earth. And in this movement from heaven to earth, that is when, because he's made himself present, we start to get a sense and we can understand his character of grace and mercy, that he initiates his relationship. And that, I should say this too, that divine initiative, divine initiative is so radical against the culture of Abraham's day. Think about it for just one second, because Abraham's neighbors, they experience their gods very, very differently. We have a lot of evidence from history, and especially from the archaeological record, uh, whereby the people in the ancient Near East, they were, they were attempting to climb up to their god through those structures that are called ziggurats. Some of you might have heard like these seven, la like a seven layer cake, as it were. They, they have these, they're, they're, they're all, they dot the, they're all over uh, southern Mesopotamia region. And it's a visual aid of humankind trying to reach God. But that's how Abraham's neighbors, their movement was <coughs> earth to heaven. But what do we see here is Abraham's God comes down to humankind for the purpose of the redemption of creation. And so what do we learn then that God is a God who desires relationship, past, present, and future, and so all of his promises of the past for the present and in the future rest on his ironclad character. If you've ever, ever struggled with the character of God, I implore you to think about this reality that we have in the biblical narrative about how God's promises are unchangeable because they rest, as he persists, on his unchanging character. Unlike me, I, I, you know, Betsy, 10 months from now, maybe we'll have that lunch. I'm, I, you know, I'll, I'm going to not be faithful to my word. I'm going to be not as ironclad with those promises. But guess what? We serve a God 
who bails us out in order to maintain the relationship with us. He bails us out for the sake of relationship. Why? Because his character is such. It brid- his mercy bridges that gap between what we don't have and what we can't bring to the table and what he has. And so the scripture then says so beautifully in Hebrew is this, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. That is the reality of the divine presence. So, Father, I thank you that you have come from heaven to earth. I thank you that we're in such a different phase of redemptive history. And we can see that we are on the side of being a people who are in relationship with you, the living God. We thank you that Jesus is the place for the relationship to unfold for us. And we thank you, Lord, that we experience your presence in our lives through the Holy Spirit. We, we thank you that we await the, our promised land. Lord, that we are your people. We have a place that we're going and we understand the reality of your presence now in this present age. And we want to thank you that we are sons and daughters of Abraham because of your character. Lord, I thank you that you have relentlessly pursued each one of us here in this room in spite of ourselves, in spite of our disobedience, you have pursued us by name. You've chased us, as a matter of fact. And we just stand in awe at that. And so we thank you, Lord, that we have become your people, that we know where we're going, and that we have a beautiful, intimate relationship with you through the Holy Spirit. So I pray, Father, that you would continue just to open up our eyes uh, to your character in our lives and how you have gone out of your way to reveal yourself to us. I pray, too, Lord, that it would make us sensitive to others to share this same reality about relationship that we have with you, that we could share it with others as well. So I thank you, God, that your character is such that we can trust you today, that even though the circumstances on the ground might look horrible, we say to you today as a, as a body of believers, as your sons and daughters, that we cling to your promise. We cling to them because clinging to your promises means we're clinging to a character of God, of a God whose character is unshakable. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So it's noon, and if you have any questions, I'd love to entertain questions, or I know if you want to go, that's fine too. Um, It's such a rich topic, isn't it? Such a rich subject. Um, when we come back next week, oh, yes, yes. So, um, could there be a, a connection between the uh, first covenantal relationship man had, which is with woman? So, God put Adam into a very deep sleep when that yes. covenant was made. Yeah. And here, He puts Abram into a deep sleep to make a covenant with him. So it seems like there's a connection. I I agree. And even though there's not the word covenant in Genesis 2 there, the concepts are because he's creating a relationship with Adam and Eve, between Adam and Eve by by forming her. So absolutely. And now he's creating a relationship between him and Abraham. Exactly. Exactly. Also, it's interesting how in the previous chapter, the kings of the plain, uh, yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah, they broke a covenant relationship with the uh, king of the kings of uh, Shinar. They did, yeah. Islam, so, so it's kind of. It's right. It's all. It's there. all there. This is the seriousness of the consequences of breaking a covenant relationship. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I want to have some question on the last item you have on the board. That's a uh, presence in the cloud. That particular. The two verses have been so confusing to me over the time because mm. I don't understand. Is, is the cloud the Bible is talking about? Is it the, this physical cloud that we see or is just an analogy? No, I actually think it is going to be a visible manifestation of him. And the reason we know that is because of the language, but also we also know it because of the history preceding that, that it was a visible manifestation. So the clouds are visible to see, like just like you see them in the sky, but then there will be this appearance, a physical manifestation within the cloud, you know, just 
he's using the language that it's going to be visible for all to see. Um, and so cloud coverage is the typical language of God appearing. He was, he was a cloud and shrouded by the cloud in the Old Testament, but now he's going to be coming in the clouds. And the point is the visibility. And so it's, that's what's the biggest concern of Thessalonians. Because you know, when God appeared twice, in the first the tabernacle and then in the temple, the, the priest could not do anything. They couldn't go in. Yeah, right. yeah. Because of the physical that's barrier. Right. Yeah. So when we come back from next, next week, I'm going to take one very important piece on this side of the redemptive circle and then tie it into the second coming because that's really, that's, that's very exciting to see where we're headed, uh, all because of the character of God. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming, everybody. So nice to see all my friends here. I love it.